Thanks for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast. If you like what you hear today, be sure to like it, subscribe, rate, and share it with everyone you know. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for regular updates because there's always another one coming up next week. Thanks to Metro Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram of Chicopee for their support. Visit their state-of-the-art dealership next to BJ's and Big Y on Memorial Drive or go to MetroJeep.com and drive home in your new Metro Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram today. Now let's get into today's episode on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Bexy's musical podcast. Crazy stars is useless. So here's the big problem with collecting records. You know, it's one thing to buy a lot of records, it's another thing to buy all the records. Due to financial considerations like having to pay for shelter, food, or college tuition, the ability for most people to buy everything is somewhat limited. Ultimately, it means that you're forced to make tough choices in life. Other times, it means you just come late to the party. In other words, shit happens. In 1987, when I was a college student, we were playing a song by Red Cross from their newly released album, Neurotica. I can't even tell you which tracks we were playing. I just remember thinking they were pretty good. But as a college student, I was either going to use my parents' hard-earned money to further my education, or I was going to spend it on either beer or records. I just couldn't do both. I often chose the beer, and many times I chose the records. And in this particular case, I made the mistake of putting Red Cross on the back burner, albeit temporarily. Fast forward a few years, and suddenly Red Cross begins reissuing their entire back catalog, and now is where my Red Cross obsession officially begins well into adulthood. And as such, I didn't just pick up the reissue of Neurotica, that album from 1987 that I was playing in college. I bought everything, all of it. Today, Red Cross stands high among some of my favorite bands of all time. Phase Shifter, Born Innocent, Researching the Blues, Neurotica. I've got them all, and it has been glorious because Red Cross is considered by many to be the most important band in America. And I'm not the only one who's followed this path in discovering why that might be true, especially now that Red Cross appears to be going through this sudden resurgence with an incredible documentary out called Born Innocent, an autobiography that's due in October called Now You're One of Us, and their absolutely fantastic self-titled double album, which is arguably one of the most ambitious albums of their career. It now puts into perspective that Steve and Jeff McDonald of Red Cross truly deserve that reputation. You just might not know it yet. Considering the range and scope of their influence, how they've seamlessly transformed from a young hardcore band to psychedelia, to glam, to early grunge, to becoming one of the greatest power pop bands of all time, no wonder some of their biggest fans include Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Sonic Youth, and countless others. And amazingly, they've been doing it since before they released their first EP in 1978, starting when they were just 11 and 14 years old. Today, in their mid to late 50s, they're cranking out some of the best work of their careers, and as a fan, I couldn't be happier for them. If you happen to be one of those people that's not fully aware of Red Cross, then today might just be your lucky day, because I might just be introducing you to one of your favorite bands of all time. My guest today is bass player, singer, songwriter, producer, Steve McDonald. Steve isn't just that former 11-year-old kid. Over the last 46 years, Steve has done a little bit of everything. For the last nine years, he's been a member of the Melvins. He's been a member of the punk supergroup Off with Keith Morris of the Circle Jerks. He's played with Jack Black and Kyle Glass and Tenacious D, as well as being a touring member with Sparks and a session musician with one of my favorite bands, Jellyfish. This is my conversation with the legendary Steve McDonald from Red Cross on Baxi's Musical Podcast. I have become a, a big fan over the course of, uh, of years. And, and like a lot of people, I probably came to the, the Red Cross tent a little bit late in life. You and I are about, this, about the same age. And, and, and I remember playing stuff from Neurotica back in, in college radio and, uh, and liking it, but not you know, investing in it. Apparently, I had to pay for an education, too. So, uh, <laughs> so years go by, and you know, I start listening to it more and I bought phase shifter and I start kicking myself. And as I'm rediscovering this and, and, and kicking myself about like what I had been missing out on 
even though I was fully aware of, of what Red Cross has been, I have to assume that you guys hear that quite a lot, especially now, you know, when people are finally starting to figure out what Red Cross is is all about. I'm sure. I mean, I think there's. I think the name is probably more known than the music often. Yeah. And uh, just because we've been associated with so many different kind of eras and scenes, and um, but. Um, yeah, but I, I I appreciate your honest account and uh, of your own. It sounds like regret. You know what? It it happens all the time. It's like you know you you know of a band that's out there, and then like late, like really late, all of a sudden you realize what was it about this band that people loved, and then that's what I sometimes find myself doing. Like, oh shit, how did I not know this? Yeah, you know, how did I let this escape? And and Red Cross was one of them. But when I dove in, I'm telling you. Jeff, I really, I, Steve, I really dove in. I bought, I bought the whole wow, goddamn thing. That. I bought, I bought the whole thing, Steve. But it feels like you guys are going through this, you know, incredible moment where the documentary, you know, Born Innocent comes out. The biography is about to come out in uh, in October, and then you drop this massive double album, which I think is easily one of the the best and most ambitious things you guys have have ever done. I mean, it's such an incredible time for you guys. I mean. It's about time, but at the same time, it's got to be ridiculously exciting. Even now, after all these years of being in a band, it's like, holy shit, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, there is a lot. It's interesting to go from, like, not a lot of activity to kind of almost too much activity. <laughs> uh, and that takes some adjustment. But, um, yeah, I never lose appreciation for the opportunity to do this. I'm very grateful and I don't care when someone gets on board. It's it, get a, whenever you do, whenever you can. I mean, I don't like hearing when someone got off board. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand that. But as you know, as the years have gone on, I don't know. For me, there's something about what you guys have done that it grows, it changes, but it gets better. To me, that doesn't always happen with a lot of bands where they get better after 40 years. I mean, I'm hearing the the, the new record. I'm thinking, Jesus, this is this is just. It's unbelievably great. Mm, that's very kind of you to say. Um, yeah, I don't know what how that happens or this phenomena of us um, <laughs> somehow um, keeping it fresh or uh, finding, uh, you know, new ways to get better. <laughs> but um, I just know I'm, I'm, I guess, an obsessive person that just, doesn't give up easily yeah. <laughs> that's all that i know well i mean i want to ask you a, a little bit about the the new album here because the, the songs you're talking about you know candy colored catastrophe i'll take your word for it stunt queen i mean it, it there's a, a it's a double album of, of gems what was different about doing this album creatively than it and than in the past because you're talking about all of a sudden having enough really good music to put make it a double album how does that happen um, well, I think the main thing that's different on this record is that I've kind of, and I knock on wood because I'm I am superstitious about it at this point, but I guess as a, as like an independent songwriter, like someone that not only collaborates, but can finish a song on their own, um, I've kind of have um, come into my own a little bit more. Yeah. And where Jeff has always been the predominant songwriter and I've collaborated with him um, and, you know, lent a riff or a middle eight here and there and the odd lyric, I really kind of, I feel like I was the one that was the real catalyst to um, getting Jeff involved on this record because I wrote a bunch of songs in advance or the hand, you know, a small, whatever. I just kept sending him these things <laughs> I was doing while I was on the road with, you know, I play in the Melvins too. So, right. and um and I'm just the bass player in the Melvin. So I actually have a lot of free time when I'm out <laughs> on the road. And uh, so I finally, I figured out a way to like, you know, make even better use of that time. And that I bring a little guitar with me and at any rate. Um, yeah. So I just kept sending him stuff and I think it kind of became apparent to him that was like, Hey, I think that we're going to make another record soon. And if I don't sort of, get on it he just my little brother is going to write this entire record himself <laughs> <laughs> so but we didn't plan on making a double album originally i just thought like you know the old school tactic of like write way more than you need and 
you know, cherry pick what you think are the strongest and you'll have your little 12 song record. But um, it just as a couple of like things kind of led one thing led to the other. And next thing we know, it's like, well, let's just release them all. And it's when we when we arrived at 18 songs, we thought, well, that's how many songs are on Exile on Main Street. <laughs> that's 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 a legitimate. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good bell. That's a good bellwether to, to, to put things on. Yeah. But, you know, but <laughs> these songs. Uh, I, as I'm listening to the record, I'm going, well, how could they possibly have pared this down to a single record? It's like, you know, w- you know, which one of these babies has to be sacrificed for the greater good? And I wouldn't even know how you would even begin to do that. Well, I can, I can actually tell you, we actually, cho- we only, we went in, well, we, the song Born Innocent, we recorded like four months earlier because it was um, the, the filmmaker, Andrew mm-hmm. Reich, who had made our documentary, Now You're One of Us. Uh, I'm sorry, Born Innocent is the name of the documentary. But um, he he asked us to write a closing credit theme that was somewhat of like a origin story song. So that he sort of that was it was almost commissioned. Mm. And um, and then so when we went and then we had 17 songs left and we thought we chose 14 and went into the studio last November with 14 thinking that we'd you know really still would only use 12 a couple of them would go on b-sides or you know foreign territory bonus tracks but uh but the songs that we didn't left behind that we didn't even record at first was uh good times propaganda band which i love (laughs) we chose um a song called stuff that i had written and then um a song called uh Oh, Emmanuel Insane, which was the last thing that we had written before we went into the studio. And it it was just, there were almost arbitrary choices because I liked everything. I liked, and then I ended up as we, as they were flushed out in the studio, I I loved everything. But, um, but those 14 that we'd gone in with had gone so well. And when we realized we had a little bit more time to finish, we were just like, let's record those other three. And we just kind of convinced our team that we were working with josh klinghoffer and michael um our engineer we just asked them if they you know do we have a couple more weeks are you guys down to do this and uh and so that's a little bit but you know like i said it was there were like arbitrary choices and once we saw what these songs could be because they were very rough demos we demoed everything but they were rough and once we saw what they could be then we were really excited to hear what these other songs could be and um and like I said, yeah, you know, the, some of the last three that we did turn out to be some of my favorites. So um, it, it was kind of a weird process. Yeah. It was, you know. You, you mentioned Born Innocent, the, the, the final song on the album. And, yeah. you know, it, and it pretty much tells the entire story of the band. And like a lot of guys in our mid to, to late 50s and, and the midlife crisis that we're just getting out of. I mean, you, you're reflecting a lot more on on your life and, and, and the things that they get you to. 55 and older in, in the process of doing that, you know, book, a movie, and, and even the song and the record. I mean, what are you guys kind of discovering about yourselves and each other during this whole process? Well, I mean that, uh, what are we discovering? Well, I mean, I think the thing that I'm discovering is that, um, that, you know, that, that things always change mm-hmm. and that that's inevitable and that it's and sometimes it's scary, but it also seems to be the um, there's a tension that comes with change often, but it's also like that's what keeps something vital. And here's sort of a lofty metaphor. I think about plate tectonics, not that I'm a scientist <laughs> or anything, but, you know, like the Earth, you know, there's these plates that are constantly moving and changing, which causes really intense things to happen on the planet like vulcan vulcanism or volcanoes <laughs> and you know this pressure mounts and then there's explosions and uh you know which are catastrophic at times and um and those but also that's what creates our atmosphere that's what creates a, a living breathing planet and other planets that don't have these changes are dead planets or <laughs> dead moons or whatever and um and and i think that's what happens with our band our little microcosm you know it's like my brother our roles are changing at times and it causes friction and it can even cause an explosion here and there but at the same time you know it's also the life's blood and it's maybe that's part of 
to what explains some of the things you said earlier about this growth. And just one of the most, and once again, back to my songwriting, I think that that has exempt, that's been one of the, the more obvious things. And once again, knock on wood, because I mean, maybe I'll dry up tomorrow. <laughs> I have an idea. So, you know, I, I watched the documentary and I, I thought it was great. But one of the things that sticks out in my mind is that you, you keep hearing over and over again, you know, that Red Cross is the most important band in America. I mean, you're, you're being introduced that way. Peers are mentioning you, that, talking to you about that way. Thurston Moore is saying it because you can't have a documentary without him. You know, Buzz and Dale from the Melvins are saying it. I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, how do you even process that kind of praise from people you admire? And, you know, in the case of the Melvins, you know, people you've even worked with. I don't even know how you would wrap your, your head around something like that. Well, my particular pathology is to, to be dismissive. And <laughs> I guess first I just kind of, if I, I've seen the movie only a couple of times and, um, uh, and it's been in theaters with people and that makes me just, I leave my body, so to speak. <laughs> but then I think, yeah, my particular pathology is kind of just kind of go like, yeah, but have we proven ourselves? And which I, I don't know what that is from, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, whatever. It's very, I'm very grateful and humbled and honored that people would pay attention to anything, much less heap that kind of praise, you know? And I also kind of understand the practical thing. It's like the, the filmmaker was inspired to tell our story, but I think he also had this goal of helping us reach a larger audience. So he had this agenda of like, putting it out there that we are deserving of a reconsideration or a, or a first look or yeah. whatever, or what have you. And, and, you know, and he made this film that in many ways, I think is a great primer for people who know nothing of us. They've heard us, haven't heard a single note. And you, the only thing I would add to it is I like, that's the one thing that I could sort of take credit for is that I think that I was really invested in trying to get in a new album out that I thought would be a great, first listen for someone that maybe had seen the documentary and then was like, well, what is this band about? And since we've been doing it for so long, if you just check us out, you're going to get this really weird impression because it expands <laughs> 40 plus years and you're going to hear us as children. You're going to hear us as teenagers. You're going to hear us. And I really wanted people to hear what we're capable of now. Yeah. So that's why I'm so invested in getting this record done in time for this. But you know, the, the story behind you guys is absolutely insane. I mean, it, just, it just, so I, you know, I, I read the book and I, I saw the documentary pretty much at the, at the same time. And it was all I could imagine is trying to imagine what my parents would have said. If I said, I'm going to start a band at 11 years old and wanted to go play gigs. I mean, I would imagine my mom wouldn't, you know, even let me out of the house, did my homework or clean my room if I want to go play with my, with my nice friends from Black Flag. I mean, to make a, like a, a career decision at 11 years old seems impossible to me, but, but your parents condoned a lot of this. I mean, they really did do quite a lot to make this happen. Tell me about their reaction to all of this, especially, you know, what is it, 1978 at this point? I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, like really early on in the hardcore scene in Los Angeles. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, they were remarkably supportive, all things considered. And, um, and yeah, I mean, well, the one thing, you know, as far as me doing, like, give granted outrageous freedoms, so you had a couple things to consider. One is that it was still the 70s people had a sort of different mentality than there wasn't really the helicopter parenting that <laughs> I'm guilty of now. But, um, and then also I had an older brother, Jeff, and he's four years older, almost four years older. So when I was 12, he's, you know, he was going to be 16 at some point during the year. And he just really liked having me around. It was a lot of strength and numbers. And um, so, you know, but I just think that, you know, my parents who are, Often people will make an assumption that we grew up in, in this like enlightened hippie kind of environment. It's not the case. My parents are working class, salt of the earth, people <laughs> that not particularly, you know, into the arts or anything, but they could recognize that we were really driven about something that didn't seem to be too dangerous. And, um, they just uh, intuitively knew to uh, um, support our our drive yeah. and in a very kind of 
forward thinking way. So I'm very grateful for that. It's very much like the 1970s approach of like, you know, no kid of mine's going to wear a helmet on a bike. But, you know, there, but there are parts of this story that when you, you, you look at it does sound kind of unimaginable. Everything from an abduction to David Cassidy to like a million other things. I mean, you lived it. I mean, it's, it's one thing to live it. It's another thing to like, you know, from, from the outside looking in, did you and, and, and Jeff see different things in, in different ways? Did you have different perspectives on the same types of things? Did you say, I didn't realize you saw it that way? Well, I mean, a lot of things we've kind of, I mean, so many stories and so many life experience are shared at this point where like at times I'll tell a story that was actually Jeff's life, not mine, <laughs> and not even realize it, you know, like, oh, the time I ran into something, you know, I ran into someone, but, uh, but in terms of like, just having a different perspective and kind of having that, um, that, you know, wow, I didn't realize you saw it that way. I mean, that definitely came up when we were working on the book because the, the co-author Dan Epstein interviewed Jeff and I, over the course of like six months separately mm. and as we're in the documentary we were together and oftenly often bickering during the interview <laughs> process during this um you know so sometimes there was a few moments like not too big but i would see there were things where we were kind of contradicted each other and um in the book and that was interesting i think it gives an interesting dynamic um, because we do, we're different, very different people. And um, for all of the similarities and the shared experience, there's also some just kind of baked in differences yeah. that uh, come out. You hear a lot about stories about bands that involve brothers and how difficult that can be. I don't know if it's because of the, you know, the shared history you have and the, the kind of relationship that, that brothers have. I mean, whether it's, you know, the kinks or, the, you know, the, the novel brothers from dire straits, even the guys from Oasis. I mean, there's there's so much history involved. It's hard enough to keep a band together with people who aren't related. How do you guys get through all that? And and maybe even more importantly, how do other members of the band get you know, dealt with when situations between you know you and Jeff blow up? Well, yeah, that that's something that kind of come came up in the documentary, and that was a little once again humbling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to hear Victor and Drizza, who played drums for us for a couple of years, say he just couldn't listen to the arguing anymore, <laughs> or the fighting, and, and and I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure, and um, and which I've always known, it's really embarrassing, and I love my parents, and I'm really grateful they're still with us, and uh, and they are king bickerers, <laughs> and. <laughs> So I think that, you know, but I mean, not to say I can't, I, I take responsibility for my part in my Michigas nowadays with my brother, but, uh, but I can see like, it was very unchecked for many years and yeah. And sometimes we would get into fisticuff and it's horrible. It's yeah. absolutely terrible behavior that I wouldn't want to be a band member in, but you know, but I think that it, yes, it's true. All the things you're saying about being in a band, I just think of bands as they're very dysfunctional families. There <laughs> always are. It's just, you know, and and you can try a bunch of ways of organizing the decision making process. You can make it really di diplomatic, democratic. I mean, democratic, or you can, you know, or just have a singular leader. And there's always, a, it's always going to be difficult. I mean, I actually find that the, the democratic way is next to impossible <laughs> uh, with bands. But, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I definitely, I don't feel like we have that figured out. I don't feel superior in any way to other bands with brothers that haven't been able to keep it together. I, you know, like when I think of, the pressures of just sharing a single responsibility with anybody is hard because it's a marriage, but it's like it becomes if there's four people, it's like a four way marriage. But then you add a sibling dynamic where there's like a pre band history with uh, all sorts of kinds of baggage or triggers, et cetera. And if you're not like, you know, vigilant about your part in that, 
it's not going to go well for you. you (laughs) And you can be really understand your part in it and figure out ways to not participate in it. But if the other person isn't doing the same thing, then it's even more torturous <laughs> sometimes, you know. So well, you you got a pretty unique perspective because you you not just working with your brother Jeff all these years, but you know you also toured with Ron and Russell Mail with Sparks. I mean, there's a situation where you know if these two fought, most of the world would never know it because they they hold everything with such a you know, a private wall behind them. But having yes. spent a couple of years with them touring. What's the difference between, you know, their relationship as opposed to your relationship? Yeah, well, I mean, I can really kind of only speculate because even with that front row seat, they still really kind of, uh, they have it so figured out. There's not a lot of room to kind of like get into the the, the weeds with them about things. But um, I definitely at one point realized that like they have a very, the, the at least from my perspective, just a very well-defined sense of role identity between the two of them that they're very comfortable with. And, you know, Ron is the songwriter. Russell sells it with his great lead vocals. Russell takes on a lot of heavy lifting in terms of like engineering records. And um, which I really have related to, because in some ways that I've tried that out. I've done that with my brother too. Like researching the blues, Jeff wrote the entire record except for one song that I sang on. And then I engineered it and produced it or whatever. And it was a kind of a really strong role definition. And then just whatever. And those guys were just both very dedicated to this singular vision. They were married to their band. And um, there wasn't, doesn't seem to be, a, or at least there hadn't been for many years, a lot of room for anything else to penetrate their focus. And that, you know, it has been, um, you know, inspiring for me because when I first joined on with them, it was sort of, it wasn't a creative lull because they never stopped, but I would say there was less acceptance or interest at that moment. And now, you know, the last time I saw Sparks play, the first time I saw, or the right before I started working with them, they play a, a club on Sunset Boulevard. And then the last time I saw them, the summer of twenty two or three, they were playing the Hollywood Bowl, you know, (laughs) and I was just like, God bless these guys, you know, like, even when I was playing in their band, I thought there was a little bit of me that thought like, I mean, I love that they're so driven, but I mean, is it, does it add up? And, you know, the (laughs) way to look at it, because that's really like the negative self-talk that I get into is like, what's the point that sort of, you know, that, that the that sort of enemy of creativity, that futility that can that can enter a body that I think is just some kind of protective device or something. But at any rate, <laughs> they have just have been like able to ignore that and just plow forward. And you know, there's the important part that they're very good. And then they've just been there, like willing to, you know, waiting for their opportunities and not um, and never squandering them. Now, you weren't part of the unfortunate decision that they made to do 21 albums in 21 days, right? You didn't you didn't join them in that one, did you? Oh, I did. I was oh, there. For, yeah, oh <laughs> I was. Yeah, which was more of a learning process. I mean, oh. watching Ron in his 60s take on that much pressure that much that much memory challenges russell didn't use a a teleprompter he was never had the lyrics on a i had i had a music music standout for my bass lines and uh he didn't um it was so impressive um i only did only but i did 13 (laughs) of the records i didn't play all 21 but i was there with them in london for that most of that month when i've done other interviews and i've told other artists about them park sometimes comes up and i've talked to russell you know about it and he, he said i wouldn't recommend ever doing it again but when you hear when you tell other artists that this is what they planned to do and they executed it to go like how the fuck did that happen <laughs> why would they do that and it's like I'm, I'm impressed by the fact that you were able to get through 13 of their records that's that's he- unbelievable Thank you. Yeah, well, I had cheat sheets. And it was also just this great, um, 
you know, it was like a, it was like a summer course. It was like, you know, when you go to school and you, and you, you try to catch up on some of your credits and you condense an entire year's worth of algebra into a one month course. And it's just really traumatizing, but then you get through it. And uh, mm -hmm. it was kind of like that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, but it's also just great, you know, uh, you know, master class and brilliant songwriting and um, and just, yeah. And once again, just watching these guys put themselves under such stress and then seeing them not crack ever and um, is inspiring. And, you know, I'd like to think that some of the, I'd like to think some of that's rubbed off on me. Yeah. You've done a lot of stuff outside outside of Red Cross. I mean, you did. You did the Melvins. You did. You worked with uh, Keith Morrison off, and we just talked about Sparks. But you also did something. That if I don't ask you about this, I'm going to want to kick myself in the pants for for not mentioning this. You also did session work with Jellyfish on their first album, Belly Button. Uh, you know, I've interviewed both Roger Manning and Jason Faulkner a couple of times, and you know, I'm you, their two albums. I think are absolutely unbelievable. But there is so much connectivity between Red Cross and Jellyfish, at least to how they presented themselves. It, it's almost undeniable in a lot of ways they both acknowledge how important Red Cross was to them. Tell me a little bit about working on, on that first album and what your thoughts are about it. Uh, well, first off, I should just make clear, I, I did play on the first album, but only on two songs. And there's really brilliant bass work on that record. And most of that's Jason Faulkner. Yeah. So I don't want to take credit for too much. But um, yeah, it was great. It was super, um, is this weird combination of just like admiration and a little bit of jealousy <laughs> and a little bit of like fire under my ass because um, they had similar goals going to the studio, but I feel like they had a different toolbox than we ever had. They really had some great skills and some knowledge on how to accomplish outrageous goals, like making music that was somewhere between Queen and the Partridge family. And uh, <laughs> cause it's like, sure, that sounds like a great combo. I'd like to see you try to do it. And then they had some skills to make it happen in a way that like I didn't possess. They even inspired me at some point to, um, as we're the band that wrote the song, notes and chords mean nothing to me, <laughs> uh, which in the early 80s, uh, I did find myself sometime after working on Jellyfish being like, like very curious about learning more about, you know, um, theory and, uh, you know, more about notes and chords and wondering if they should mean anything to me and um, at least being able to name them and communicate about them. And um, so I went to, I went, I, and I went to just talking about school a second ago, um, my knowledge of that, cause I didn't go to college out of, out of high school. I got in the van and went on tour. And then later in life, after doing things like the jellyfish, I was like, you know, and those guys were like USC music school graduates. And I thought, Oh, maybe I should learn some of those rules and not so that I can abide by them, but just so when I break them, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And so that was one thing that also inspired me, but you know, uh, they inspired that, that affected me. And I went and studied music theory for a couple of years when Red Cross was on hiatus. One of the things that, that I've always admired about Red Cross, and I, I, I think this is one of the things that makes bands like yours so much fun is that you've, you've never, ever shied away from acknowledging the, the music that you love. You, you've mentioned the, the Partridge family, but I mean, you guys have played covers throughout your entire career. Like you did on, you know, team base from Monsanto, you play kiss and ABBA and Jesus Christ, superstar. And, 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 you know, other bands have done that, you know, the, the Dickies and, and the replacements, even, you know, golden shower of hits is maybe from the, the circle jerks is maybe a, a, an unappreciated masterpiece. And from what I understand on this, on the, the tour you guys have been on, you're playing crazy horses by the Osmond brothers. And, and I have that freaking album. Uh, Cause it kicks ass. Uh, <laughs> it does. Tell me about how you guys choose the kinds of covers that you, that you do play. Because I remember back when I was in college, Red Cross came to Milwaukee and you opened with Jesus Christ superstar and everyone's coming back. Like, you're not going to believe what I saw last night. And you're not going to believe what they opened up with. It was like the most exciting thing that people had ever seen in their lives. That was your opener. How do you choose those songs? Well, I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's just, um, sometimes they would just be in rehearsal and we would um, get sick of playing our own songs and we would just find ourselves cycling through whatever we could, uh, you know, remember of our songs that we love. I remember Jesus Christ Superstar was something that was kind of became an obsession with us sometime in the late 80s. And um, 
You know, I don't know. I mean, it's been, we've been doing it for so long. There's been different motivations behind different covers over the years. When we did our Teen Babes from Monsanto sort of mini LP in the mid eighties, which was all covers except for a reinvention of a, one of our own songs, Little right. Blair. Um, that was, I think the Jeff had sort of a specific goal in mind, which was to educate the hardcore kids about <laughs> um, the history of rock as we saw it. And, um, you know, so that was maybe a little bit, I don't know, pedantic or something. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> we're going to school everyone. And then, um, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar, that would have just been like pure, you know, admiration. Um, you know, we talk about in our documentary how sometimes a show would, you know, just eventually just turn into an entire cover, cover set <laughs> as we would try to do, you know, all of side two of Sergeant Pepper or something, you know what I mean? And right. And a lot of times that would just be a celebration. Like it would just be like, we're off the clock. Let's just have a good time, everyone. Or sometimes you, you'd be something, there was a technical difficulty and it'd be like, quick, play God of Thunder. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know, but it always seems to somehow, I guess it's always about connecting with people. It's, you know, it's the same thing. And sometimes it's an easier way to connect with people. Even though we wrote the song, you know, we're a cover band, <laughs> we were, you know, making fun of cover bands in, in our youth. Um, you know, I think that we just love connecting with people. And sometimes that's the easiest way is with, so, and, and often it would also be like, uh, and usually they're pretty obscure. So often they're deep cuts or they're by obscure artists. But I love that. So, you know, if, if you're going to pay money to see a show, sometimes it's great to, to just know, you know, if I'm going to have fun, it's nice to know the band is having fun too. It's not, you know, it's not like, uh, I assume you're doing a cover song. All of a sudden you decide to haul off and punch your guitar player. Like what happened in Boston over the weekend? You know, I assume that probably doesn't happen all that much when you're playing an Osmond Brothers song. Well, the Osmonds, that kind of came up one night. Well, we'd learned it a long time ago when we think we did it on a, on a compilation record, but um, we were in Seattle. That's a prime example. We were in Seattle on this last tour and Jeff realized on stage that we were going to be in Salt Lake City soon. So he's like, we better do something. We better get ready for Salt Lake. And, he, <laughs> and on stage, just said, let's do Crazy Horses. And we gave it a shot and made our way through it. And it it just went really well, you know? Um, yeah, it, I want to, I, if i kind of feel like if I can't at least, you know, have some joy myself, then, yeah. you know, that's part of the payment for doing it. And, um, and then I keep hearing people saying that it brings them joy and not that, you know, I can't count on that always happening, but I do feel like there's, you know, what's wrong with that. And sometimes even the goofier the song is, you know, the more fun, it, like again, the Osmond Brothers. Although the the Dictators just recorded a version of that too. I don't know if you knew that. Oh wow! Yeah, awesome. It, it's really really good. But one of the things that, that that is also really interesting is you know both you and your brother you know have have both married women who have also had long substantial musical backgrounds. Your wife Anna and her you know, her whole family's got a you know a pretty extensive background. And you know Jeff married you know Charlotte Caffey from the from the Go Go's. All four of you have that same experience recording touring doing goofy ass interviews with total idiots i mean those kinds of things you can all share in that it sounds like it, it must be kind of like a, a great advantage to do what you do knowing that you can all relate to it in the same way well sure i mean i think it's you know it's we share a lot of responsibilities these are real marriages as opposed <laughs> to like the faux marriage of being in a band or the whatever kind of marriage of being in a band. And uh, and so for me, it's very important that whoever, you know, that the person I'm with can understand, you know, in ways that it's impossible to articulate sometimes why you do what you do. And, um, and when we first got married, neither one of us were touring much, but, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I never misrepresent myself. And I think that, and also just like it's, you know, um, I just have always been attracted to that creative spark in other people as well. And um, so, you know, it it makes sense that I would, that both of us, I always said that Jeff and I were like girl band groupies and um, <laughs> we're like sort of successful groupies and um or, or there's also a term, the GBG, the girl band geek. <laughs> and we're that too. And uh, 
but um yeah you know i mean it, it, it yeah it's it's definitely like the, it's like an enterprise red cross and i i can i include charlotte and anna in the enterprise they help us so much and you know anna helps me with our taxes <laughs> Charlotte helps us with our, you know, publishing stuff. And, <laughs> you know, it's all that stuff. It's like, it's a family business in many ways. And it, or it's part of the business of our families. And so, um, yeah, I don't know who else would be able to stomach it <laughs> other than people who have been in the trenches themselves. I would imagine that, uh, you know, you got a movie, a book, an album, but someone's still selling you. Hey, uh, Steve, the, the, the trash <laughs> needs to be emptied. You're, could you open up a jar? Can you lift this? You know, that kind of thing. That, that, that kind of stuff still never ends, no matter how big of a rock star you may be. Or do you, you think you're really cool when your kid is, like, cringing? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, don't say that in front of my friends. You did I'm what? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> A free pass. I was in a punk line at 12. You do not get a free pass. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are going to go back on the road in October. You're going to Europe for about like two and a half months, but then you come back. What do you do after all that is done? I mean, just do you just get back to work? Do you just collapse? I mean, you and I are not getting any younger, uh, Steve. I know what I would want to do, but what do you guys do? Well, I'm trying to create more touring opportunities for us during the year of Red Cross. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I don't know. I can't really say now, but I'm still hoping that there's a few other territories that we can hit before the year of Red Cross is over, or if not early in uh, 2025. Um, I'm going to continue to write. It's hard for me to write on tour with Red Cross because I've, I'm wearing so many different hats because um, I'm kind of like quasi-manager, et cetera. And, uh, but then, uh, but then next year I'll be touring with the Melvins a lot. I have a very busy year at the Melvins next year. Very cool. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully there's time for a vacation in there at some point and the whole family can go do something fun. I'm not sure, but, uh, or staycation. My fan, my, my wife and son, they, they were kind of, um, they like staycations. And uh, when the, when the uh, pandemic hit, I mean, not to make light of the pandemic, but a lot of people didn't like quarantine. My family liked quarantine. Like they're like, we've been training for this for years. My wife and I did too. We, she, she's a teacher who was teaching from home and I, I'd come home from doing the radio show and I try to be really quiet. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm listening to her teach in the other room. And after all was said and done, I was like, this isn't so bad after all, <laughs> we, we could live this way. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And which is interesting because I'm not on the road so much, but it's true. And in many ways, I'm a homebody too. Yeah. So, but I have a much more, more adventurous spirit than they do. So it's, it works out. Yeah. Steven, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. I mean, like I said, I've, I've become a big fan and everything you guys have done, I've just absolutely loved. So thank you so much for doing it. And uh, I hope to talk to you soon sometime. Thank you so much. The name of the new Red Cross documentary is called Born Innocent. It's about to get a nationwide theatrical release this fall. Check out the book, which comes out in a few weeks, entitled Now You're One of Us. And, of course, you need to definitely check out the new self-titled double album. It is amazing. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. You can email me at facts at rock102.com. I'd love to know what you think. Thanks again to Metro Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, and Ram at Chicopee. But most of all, thanks to you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.